Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm stepping in for Alex Payne this week as he is in desperate need of reupholstering his chaise long. Konnichiwa, Genkizeska. Is that, I think that's supposed Genki to be, desu, how are please. you? Genkidesta? That is, mate. Well, that's about you all go. I've got, mate. Genki. <laughs> that's, one, that's definitely all you're getting out of me. That's probably all <laughs> I got out of that Rugby World Cup 2019. Uh, how is the Japanese? Are, are you trying or? Man, I'm trying my best. Uh, we get we get some lessons through the club actually, so it's a uh, decent decent laugh for the other foreign boys. Yeah, uh, they're probably probably a little bit younger than me, then, so they're taking it up a little bit easier <laughs> than myself. I assume that you and uh, Leah Fano are, are just do, doing all the communicating in English, so I suppose it helps with your fly off. Oh, does he play? Is he starting fly off most times? So I suppose that makes it easier. Well, normally, mate, but sadly, he's. Um, He's done his Achilles, so he's not played in any any of the league games, mate. So I'm playing with a, a young Japanese fella at ten at the moment. So that's uh, that's causing me a couple of issues along the way. <laughs> Do you just put point it in, mate? <laughs> right. Point it. Yeah, it's a little bit of that, mate. I don't think he even understands my pointing sometimes, but I'm, I'm having good fun, mate, and uh, certainly trying to work with him. With a with a Japanese ten, is it mainly he's going to run it, so you take control of? Field position, everything like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying my best. Like in terms of like the way we try to play here at Shining Arts, it's pretty much we like to run the ball. And you know, I'm saying that this might not be the best option sometimes, boys. And so I'm pretty much doing all doing all the kicking and, and trying my best to encourage the, uh, some of the boys to chase. Mate, it could be it could be great for you. Get back in, just full on every run, 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 and you could then get back into this Scottish team because that's all that's what they need. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're not wrong. Huh? The Scottish boys are doing well. But it looks looks good, fun to play in, and uh, you know, hopefully they can go well again this weekend in Paris. But you know, I'm, I'm certainly not getting any younger now, uh, Tin. So probably have to skip on that one. You're only 35. I mean, you've at least got another good year in you. Um, what do you make of this Scottish team? Actually, just before we we sort of crack into Japanese lifestyle, I mean. Uh, would you love, you know, could if you could, would you have loved to be be playing in this team? Because it looks, from a balanced squad point of view, it's 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 the best it's been for a long, long time, is it not? Yeah, for sure, it's definitely up there. Tins, I think they're they're playing really well. I think uh, when I look at the team, I think that as much as they're playing excellent rugby, I think that certainly from the time in the World Cup, they're probably they're looking to me like they're playing a little bit more pragmatic. In terms of the way they're exiting, and, and certainly when I was still involved, you know, they talked about playing the, the fastest rugby in the world, but now it looks a little bit more controlled, uh, but still with that attacking element uh, to it. And I certainly, Gregor as a coach, that's what he likes to do. So, um, and I think, you know, they're just probably got a little bit more steel up front in, in the pack, which is obviously helping them, uh, you know, stay in games. And in, in a couple of the games and that they've lost there in the Six Nations, they've probably uh, they're certainly been really tight and, and maybe unlucky against Wales. If you've got a prediction for this weekend, I think it's going to be a carnage game where they just go toe-to-toe. I just think it's going to be that way. I, I, I texted Hoggy earlier to get some dirt on you. We won't go into nicknames and stuff and <laughs> what he told me to get into. But um, he uh, I, I he said, the looser the better for us, is what he said. Do you think that's the way it's going to be? Well, I think it will be, you know. I think, I think France will probably try their best not to make it like that, but I don't think they'll be able to help themselves. Um, like I know Damien Penno pretty well from my time in Clermont and he's as he's as loose as they come even last weekend in that last couple of minutes he was chucking off loads and I was a bit like oh so I think it's it's I think it'll actually suit Scotland uh, this weekend to be honest I think it'll open up and I think Scotland are, are really dangerous yeah I th- I, I'm just so happy it means something so I, you know it means something for Scotland because it could be there is it right it could be their highest finish in God knows how long if they get the yeah. Right I result. think in terms of the Six Nations, I think it could be could be the highest ever in terms of second. I've finished I think third once before, um, so hopefully the boys can uh, get up there and, and finish in second. And uh, you're right, it's brilliant that there's there's still a lot riding on on the game this weekend. Anyway, let's get back. How is how is Japan? How is because you're in Ich Ichinawa, isn't it? Ichinawa, is that Ichinawa? Uh, it's Where like Ichikawa, but Ichikawa, it's, sorry. Uh, it's it's a place called Uriyasu City, uh, I'm in, which is which is cool. It's only we're only one stop away from Tokyo Disneyland, which is <laughs> ideal for, for for the kids, mate. You just jump on the train and head along there. And when, when um, you when, is that your your side gig, isn't it? When you uh, you go and dress up as one of the dwarves, right? 
That's your sight. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's your weekend. I won't get into that one. But... <laughs> You'd definitely be uh, happy. Right, You'd good. be happy. You'd be the happy. Happy. Yeah, it definitely would be, mate. No, I'm, listen, I'm having I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, I think we're we're pretty lucky with the the area we're in. It's it's quite open, and you know, as much as we're in a an apartment, it doesn't feel we're in a you know a massive city. We're kind of just on the the, the outside of Tokyo, so mm. having a lot of fun. You're in I'm golfing much... territory, right? Aren't you? Golf, there's yeah, mate, golf there's courses not far away. I remember the Zozo Whoa. Championships from the 2019. That that's wasn't. Right. That's not too far away. Um, it's I can't not meant what the name to... of the course was, but bit of golf getting played. Um, probably not as much as I like with a couple of the couple of young kids flying about. You know, keep looking after them, but having a lot of fun. Um, you know, learning the, the culture and. Uh, learning new things every day in terms of language and stuff so it's certainly completely different and um, chucking a couple of earthquakes into the equation it's uh, it's exciting times what was what's the what was the strongest one that you've had yeah so we've had two pretty strong ones actually we've had a 7.3 um, oh, yeah. I think it was a 7 7.1 which was only three or four days ago there uh, but yeah the one the one the 7.3 one that was we got a fright on that one that was but maybe 11.30 at night, and we've got the old uh, alarm going off on the iPhones, and then the next minute, you know, the whole place is on the move. Oh, right. So, they, so what, is that like a, you get a, Jap- you get a Japanese notification that, get ready? Yeah, you, there must be like a setting and um, iPhones or whatever. So That's amazing. So Rachel and I, were, were, yeah, mate, it's pretty amazing. Rachel and I were sleeping, and then all of a sudden, we, this, this alarm started going off on both of our phones. Uh, so you know, I'd rolled out of bed and basically shit myself before I realised what was happening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, then the next minute, the whole the whole house was on the move. Uh, what well, uh, that would be bonkers. You like roll over. You know, oh, who's texting? What? Yeah. Like what? Like was, you, I would just I just would know. It's normal life for them, is it? But then you first one, you're gonna panic. Like Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's normal. But like, before I knew what happened, I was like, I'd rolled out of bed. I was standing on my feet, like, because I got, got, got a fright. And then, obviously, we realised what was happening. Like, it wasn't just moving. It was properly, like, rocking side to side type thing. So I was like, oh, you know, what, what the hell do we do type thing? So, you know, I've sort of opened the front door, looked out, and there's maybe, like, two or three lights came on in another apartment. <laughs> No, nobody else is coming out of the apartments around. So I was like, well, well I guess we just stay then. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that is bonkers. That is bonkers. Yeah, and we had, uh, we had one the other night there. We were, uh, uh, I, was about, I was on the phone back home to my parents, actually, and just on FaceTime, sort of sitting there. And, and I was just like, oh, shit, are we having an earthquake? Um, you know, so it's a weird feeling. And then you realise that the, the building's on the move. And nothing, because they, they obviously build all the buildings to nothing. You don't ever see much destruction on the back end of it, no? Obviously, everything's just set up for it. Everything seems set up for it, I think, especially in where all the all the newer places are, are built. Uh, that, that's certainly, I guess, why, why we're lucky here. Everything's been built up in the, the last sort of 10 years. So, you know, in terms of engineering, it's it's all the stuff to cope with it. Um, a little bit further up in um, a place called Sendai, uh, I've met a Scottish guy since I've been out here, and, and he had a bit of damage to to one of his um, properties up there. He, he's got his own business, and some of the escalators and stuff had came down, and, and the big ones. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's still uh, still a bit of damage in the first one. Is is would you say they train harder than what you what you were used to back home or not? Um, definitely up there. That's for sure. Mate. In terms of like the work ethic. Um, and stuff like that, and I think that's that's probably what I've learned since I've been here. Is in terms of their culture, the way they're brought up, in terms of their discipline, like their work ethic. You know, they're they're, they're like used to being told what to do when they're at school and stuff. They just they get told and they don't answer back, and and they do it. And that's that's probably a little bit how it how it still is for them in terms of you know the, when the coaches talk to them, they don't nobody speaks back. They, they work really hard, and um, but but it's good. It's man, it's a good league. There's a lot of there's a lot of good players out here. Um, we play we play Toshiba uh, tomorrow actually. Uh, Sita Tamani Valu in the team. Matt Todd, um, uh, Michael Leach is playing as well. So you know it's it's a it's a strong pretty strong league as well. Yeah. Have you um, 
obviously, obviously, I had such a good time in in 2019, just being out there on the uh, obviously working hard for the podcast <laughs> we were doing at the time, but experience all the culture. Um, have you got? Are you now a coffee? Were you a coffee aficionado? I mean, Hass took me on this journey of Japan, Japan, and coffee and coffee houses and any of that whiskey have you got obviously you you being scottish you must be a whis- whiskey connoisseur but they obviously have renowned for their whiskey in japan as well have you settled into any of that or are you just built gr- building your portfolio of coffee shops and, and whiskey bars um th- there is a big coffee scene out here but again we're pretty lucky in the area we've got a couple of um a couple of nice places that are um you know, you'll, you'll get your flat whites and stuff So, um, as well. So uh, fairly lucky. In terms of whiskey, I've, I've not done too much uh, yet. It tends because of uh, coronavirus as well. The, the country's been in a state of emergency. But certainly I'm going to go out and get a look at some of the uh, big distilleries and stuff. I'm, in, I'm actually involved with a, a whiskey company back home in Scotland who, who are keen to eventually uh, crack the market out here in Japan as well. So I'm uh, behind enemy lines trying to, <laughs> trying to find uh, a little bit more yeah. information out you're not you're not in with Barclay, are you at, at Dalmore? No, no, I'm not in with. Get hounded uh, by him all the time at the moment, John Barclay. So yeah, uh, yeah. he's always, he's always no, looking no. for potential clients. <laughs> we're in. Um, I'm in with a new, a new whiskey startup. It's called uh, Wolf Craig uh, right. Distillery. Um, um, the man, the main man behind it, or one of the main men, is, is Richard Parson. Uh, for anybody who knows their whiskey. He's, uh, his nickname is The Nose, and he's, uh, he's got 55 years' experience in the business. He's, he's one of the world's best, and it's a new whiskey startup uh, in Scotland. Uh, the distillery is due to be built this year, and then uh, obviously distillation stuff will start after that. So uh, exciting times, and obviously, as you said, there's got, you've got uh, Suntory and stuff out here as well, who are huge, and, and they also have uh, one of the teams in the league as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So you've, how have you, how we, do you find, how has it all compared? Obviously you've played in pretty much every, every league that's on the planet. So uh, how have you found it from, uh, you know, pro rugby to top 14, premiership, Japan, are they all pretty similar or is it, obviously you're a lot shorter and intenser out there, aren't you? There's not as many games, but not you, you're shorter. I thought you were about my height there. <laughs> no, you know, no. it's, 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 it's not a shorter season, but it's a shorter actual uh, competition season and you're only playing 10 games or whatever um, so how have you found it how has it compared to what you've experienced everywhere else definitely different in terms of one probably in terms of the, the way they play the rugby quite quite loose and um, you know free flowing as, as much as it can be um, and that, I guess that was that was one of the reasons I probably came out this way and then as well as a length of the season as, as you say we've got this season, seven regular league games and then into the playoffs after that with a potential three or four games. So, you know, you're done in 11, 11 12 games, pretty much the season's over. So, uh, a lot of the, the pre-seasons, are, you've got quite a long lead in and we got delayed this year. Um, so, but definitely a bit, bit more looser on the rugby, definitely yeah. compared to France. France is, you know, a bit slower, a bit more uh, attritional. But, you know, definitely, definitely an awesome time for me to come in experience something different at this stage of my career. If you if you compared all the leagues, would you say that uh, French was probably the biggest grind? It's a long season, isn't it? Yeah, French French was the biggest grind, definitely. And, and almost, I mean, it probably wasn't too many more games than, than the Premiership in England, but definitely felt like that just because, you know, you'd gone away to, whether it be like a Brieve or an Agen and, like these teams don't play any rugby, they're just you know trying to you know kick the nuts off you basically <laughs> and get stuck in here and a bit, a bit, little bit old school. So, in terms of the length of the season, French, the French league was the hardest. Did you with the French league, do you enjoy the little breaks though at Christmas? Is that something that like you would say the Premiership or pro rugby could learn from? Is, is, is having those little windows or not? Um, probably in terms of. Like nobody really wants to play like over Christmas and stuff, do they? Like you know, whereas like when you were playing tens, it's just Christmas is the one time a year you want to sort of come together and have a few days off with the family and almost sort of not reset, but just just spend just a few days, you know, away from it. And whereas I think back in the UK, you know, you're playing twenty sixth, twenty seventh, and you just can't relax at all as a player. So, um, you know, certainly in France, have you ever got that week off and around Christmas? Yeah, it was an awesome, awesome uh, part of the season. 
And make sure you enjoy it though when you retire, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I will, mate, don't worry. <laughs> um, just going back through, uh, through like if we go back, was it obviously you came to uh, you came to Gloucester? Was it in 2014? Was it 2014 you came to Gloucester? Yeah. Uh, how must hard? 2014-15, yeah. Yeah. How hard was it leaving Edinburgh, where you'd obviously been for seven years, and and why why was the decision? Why, why did you take that decision to sort of move on? Um, I think it was. I think if I'd stayed at Edinburgh, it was it was the easy thing to do, and and I was quite aware of essentially. I know probably what the reputation of you know Scottish players and Scottish teams are from from the outside. You know, a lot of players or, or clubs or countries don't don't really rate us. So I think for me it was the, it was the challenge to to go away and, and really test myself in, in that sort of environment, a, a proper rugby club like Gloucester, and that really appealed to me as well. It was like a for me Gloucester is like a proper rugby team with an awesome support and uh, and stuff like that. So the main reason was yeah, get out get outside of the Scottish rugby bubble, go and test myself in a different environment. And I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time at Gloucester, for sure, with an awesome bunch of boys. And, uh, and uh, you know, we managed to win the, the Challenge Cup and um, uh, I think it was my second season down there. Yeah, it's similar to me when I left Bath. We we won that in the first, I think, the first season. Then we got to loads of finals and lost. So even though it was <laughs> the right decision in, for a rugby perspective, we didn't quite get everything we'd hoped for. But um, and then obviously, uh, Claremont was that just timing, or was it uh, financial, or was it experience, or was it family, or you know, or a mixture of all of all. Probably a mixture of all. I think, um, you know, my time at Gloucester was in terms of uh, we probably didn't fully hit our straps, uh, sadly. And uh, I think when it, when a club like Claremont comes in for you, um, it's one of the ones you're probably only going to get one opportunity at it. And I didn't really want to uh, turn them down, to be honest. I think Claremont as a club like really suited me as a, as a person in terms of the way it was run. Um, and and just I guess that French experience as well. I'd always wanted to play in France, um, kind of as, as a youngster for whatever reason. Um, and just when when that opportunity came along to, to go to a club like Clermont, it, it was too good to turn down. And essentially, I jumped at the, the opportunity uh, to get out there. Obviously, did you ever play out there, uh, Tim? No, I looked. I looked at it, it in twenty eleven. Toulon, um, sort of said they were interested but I, I was a bit worried in the fact that it was obviously a world cup year and i didn't really want to be going back there straight after the world cup and then because you mm. you i wouldn't know any of the boys obviously the language and everything anyway 2011 went <laughs> the way it went and uh <laughs> that world cup went the way it went and, and it sort of didn't happen and then i did look at going to Aix en provence just to for a lifestyle type thing but unfortunately when your wife's got like 11 horses it makes it a bit complicated and I didn't fancy commuting so no I ended up uh, staying at Gloucester I think I think I would yeah I I mean I it would have been great and I think I think if it had been a different time in terms of you know where I was family wise I just wouldn't have worked for the family I mean I wouldn't I remembered John Kerwin asked me towards the end after I did the uh played with him uh in the Barbarians he'd asked if I went I'd go over and play for the Auckland Blues, and I would. I literally wanted to do it. I was, but I just couldn't. You can't leave. I couldn't. The family can't move over there. Zara can't run her sport yeah, from over there. It's, yeah. It adds, you know, when you've got about twenty ton of horse with you, it makes it difficult. Freight trains get them out there. So, and I'm not sure the competition levels the same over in in New Zealand. So, yeah, I, I would love to have done that. And if I could have done it on the short term, I, I possibly would have done it. it just then, then you're not investing. You've got to invest if you're going to go over there and buy in. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's shame. I would have I would like to have tried some other places, but I just. For whatever reason, it never worked. Mainly yeah, reason, it things. never worked. Never worked out. I managed to move fifty miles from Bath to Gloucester. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that, that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Um, actually, one thing I wanted to talk to you about because it's been in it, it, and ask your opinion. It's obviously people playing different positions. Um, obviously, there's been talk around. Uh, this week from an England point of view that George Ford didn't come back on because Dan Robson ended up playing at 10 
Um, you've played at 10, I'm played at nine. Um, is it something that can easily be done? In terms of, obviously, Hoggy stepped up at 10 from fullback, not quite the same as the nine and 10. Is it something that it's not a big deal if you if you train at it and you get used to it, you still you st- fly halves and scrum halves, they still think the same? Um, that's a good question, Tins. And I think, especially that international level, I think in terms of that 10 slot, it, it's really difficult to, to probably to fit in there. And, you know, all due respect to Italy, I think, you know, it's probably the perfect game for, for, for Hoggy uh, to fit in there. And, and I guess, I guess the way Scotland try and play as well, it's, it's probably suits, I guess, Hoggy uh, a little bit mo- moving into that position. But in, in general terms, I wouldn't say it's it's too easy. Um, certainly, p- switching from nine to ten, two very different positions. Obviously, ten you got to look, do a lot more defending um, as well. So pretty pretty difficult to do on on the whole. But you know, certainly some players you know can do it easy easier than others. And, and certainly, Hoggy, uh, he he's one of them because you know he's such an excellent player. And you know, don't forget, Hoggy played a little bit of ten as well in the. 2013, I think, Lions do to, to Australia. So, you know, he's, he's an excellent talent and I guess Scotland are lucky to have him. Yeah. So basically, you're just saying you're slightly more talented than everyone else because you can play both. <laughs> I, 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 I just tried to play both things. <laughs> uh, do you think you'll, ever, uh, do you think you'll end up do you think you'll end up sl- slotting in out there or not at any point? Is, it, is that something they talked about? Have you run there or not? Yeah, I've, I've, I've already played there um, in the last 20 minutes of, of games and stuff. So I quite enjoy it, actually, because a lot of times at nine, you, you're just getting to rucks, you know, and, and chucking the ball. And you mean it's, e- it's easier on the lungs? Is that what you're saying? It, it is, but it's certainly, certainly the way <laughs> we're playing. R- rather than having to run five metre line to five metre, you can just run 15 to 15 and <laughs> just direct traffic a little bit more. So that's a bit more fun. You get to pick your head up and spend a little bit more time, uh, you know, rather than chucking your head in the rock so it's something I've quite enjoyed through my career uh, amazing um, just going back to the, the comparison stuff is where where do you feel you've been most at home is that Edinburgh or was living in the uh, the Mastiff the Mastiff Central or I'm not sure Gloucester's going to fit into this but maybe Gloucester <laughs> or living in the hustle and bustle of Tokyo what, what, what suited think... Greg Laidlaw the most I get kind of similar to what you were talking about in terms, in terms of where you are with your, your family life and, and stuff. I guess it was different. Obviously, at the time, Edinburgh was was definitely my my sort of home, and that that was that was easy. But I definitely think probably looking back um, now, probably Claremont. Uh, it was funny, you know, because you know Rachel, my wife, she's probably pretty nervous about moving out to France with with everything the language and. You know, when we were leaving, she, she didn't really want to leave. Uh, and that was quite funny. And I guess that maybe probably sums up Claremont as a, as a town rather than as, as a rugby club because uh, the people in, in the town, it's, it's not the most glamorous location in France, sadly for me, but the, the so people in, in the town It's basically farm, awesome. farmer central, is it? And then everyone works for Michelin or... No, Michelin, yeah. yeah. Yeah, everybody's pumping out tyres or, or working on farms, really, and... Slap bang in the middle of France, um, a little bit isolated because of that. But in terms of like the people there, they're willing to look after you, and, and obviously it's a big rugby town, so you know that, that obviously helps so you settle in. But certainly looking back, we, we very much felt you know almost at home there. Um, you know, and, and maybe a couple of years down the track, if I ever get into coaching, I think I'd love to go back to France. No. Is that where you? What do you? Well, obviously now that I know you're going to be the whiskey connoisseur and the the, the whiskey. <laughs> mogul at the end of it is that what you see yourself doing the next coaching or is it going to be a mixture of a bit of coaching business or what what do you what do you see in the future yeah hopefully a bit of both tends if if if, that, if my ideal looks like something it definitely looked like um you know definitely a bit of coaching staying in the game um somewhere along the line i'm really passionate about my um, rugby, um, getting back to Scotland potentially at some point. Obviously, I've just mentioned going to France, but uh, I'd love to, to get back to Scotland at some point and, and help out there where I can. Uh, but definitely a little bit of stuff away from the game. I don't know what you were like. Um, and obviously, you've kind of moved away from the actual rugby side of things now. But I think to have that something else away from the game is 
it's probably a bit more exciting now for me and a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, I don't know. What you, what, how did you feel when you sort of finished up playing? Were you yeah, wanted I mean, to do well, straight away? Or? Yeah, well, I, I sort of had that two year as player coach. So um, I got that coaching bit. And uh, and then I was, I was going to go straight into coaching. But I think going straight into coaching is sometimes the easy. I mean, it doesn't sound like the easy option, but it, it can be because people are going to want you just for your experience. And, and I enjoyed the coaching. I, I mean, I had contrasting years. You know, we, we first year under Nigel Davis, we finished fifth just outside the top four. And it was, um, and it was an amazing year, amazing first year. The players were on fire. They, they really, they really, yeah, we should, we should have, could have, would have been in that top four and then moved on and, um, but then the second year we finished ninth and we had loads of injuries. We, you know, players were making the same errors. We were just losing tight games and, and suddenly it's a, it's a very, a big reality check on what coaching can be. You know, you can sit high and get plaudits one minute and then literally the players always get the plaudits. The coaches always get the criticism. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, uh, it was an eye opener and it was, and it was all around when law changes as well and high balls and stuff. And I, I, I was like, I don't really know. Yes. Whether I want this. Don't really know whether I want this. And like uh, Nigel Davis wanted me to sign a one year as a, as a full on coach, no playing, which I didn't really want to do. Cause I still, I still love playing. So yeah. I wanted to play. But then I went, okay. What year was that intense? Because that was uh, Nigel. Because I thought. 2014. 14. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, because I spoke to Nigel and it was basically him that kind of signed me at Gloucester. And then yeah, yeah. by the time I got there, he, he'd left. Yeah, yeah. So that was the last year. I, I was his his bats coach. So I was looking forward to kicking your ass and telling you how to play the game. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, and then he, and then because we finished ninth, because we lost our last game of the season to Worcester. In his contract, if he finished below eight, they could review his contract. So they then, got uh, rid- they, I then got, that, no? yeah, then they got rid of him. So and then by getting rid of that him, uh, it ba- basically because I hadn't signed my contract, it it basically ended my because I, I knew that um, obviously Humps was coming in and Humps was going to if I was going in as a head coach, I would always break, take pick my own staff or you know you can't take on what's in the past um so yeah so I knew that I was out then and so my mindset was right have a year out see where I'm at in a year if rugby is my main drawback then it will draw me back if if it's not it won't and you'll just move on and I sort of just moved on a little bit I love still love the game love playing it for my local club when I can um and still watching it and doing the podcast and everything and um but yeah I think whether I'd ever get back into coaching, I'm, I'm not sure I w- would get into coaching. Whether I'd like to be involved in a club, in some level, then that's possibly different. But coaching, I'm not sure. Mentoring, so stuff like that is where yeah, definitely two, one two, on one, two different things. Yeah, one on yeah, ones with on people. And, yeah, so that. But we'll see. I you think there's time. a big. I think there's a big. I reckon there's a big space in, in the game for that sort of mentor mentor role. Definitely, when I when I look back on, you know, where I've been, and I think. Just to have that type of person, I've, I guess I've been maybe not lucky, but I've always looked to have that sort of person, you know, beside me that's that's been in a similar situation. I think you can learn like heaps, heaps, even if it's just to sound something off them. You know, I, I've definitely that's definitely helped me throughout throughout my career. Yeah, I I, mean, I think I I agree with you. I think there's a big hole there in terms of what I what I see as a situ, situational awareness or situational coaching or okay you've done that but what else could you have done and what what else do you see and what you know it's just then there's little bits of technique what why don't you try this for centers especially in like defending at 13 there's loads of little nuances about making sure you you put yourself in the right position which i generally don't know whether people still do and it's little bits like that where i sort of get my kick out of it and um you know I, but whether it happens, we'll see. Never shut anything down. It's we'll always see. the future. It's always the future. That's it, mate. You're right. Uh, one thing, obviously, you got called up for Lions in 2017, didn't you? Ben, for replacement for Ben Youngs, I think. Looking at this year and how Scottish rugby is and how great the champ, I think how great the Six Nations has been and the competition throughout, you must be excited about how many Scottish lads could go on that tour. Or who do you think? I am excited. Who do you think that. could go on that tour? Well, firstly, is I'm excited, um, and I think obviously we've got another game to play uh, this weekend, which which I, again I, I see as a, 
uh, a real positive for Scotland in terms of if they could get out, out to France and, and put in a big performance away from home. Obviously, they've already beaten England um, down at Twickenham for the first time in a long time. Uh, this year, I think some of the players in the team playing excellent rugby hockey. Obviously, he's, he's been a standout again from the back. I think Hamish Watson, for me, has probably played himself certainly, certainly in, in there into contention. Uh, Johnny Gray, he can't be far away either. He, his work rate is phenomenal, and I think he's also in that his move to Exeter has helped him out. Even some of the Roy, Roy Sutherland, loose head, I think, you know, you, you look at him, he, he does his job week in, week out, strong strong ball carrier, good scrummager. Um, did I mention Finn there? Yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, no. No, yeah but... obviously Finn. I think Finn's a, you know, he's a box of tricks. And I mean, for me, you got to take Finn because you're not going to go and, and win a test match series against South Africa doing what South Africa do. And I think he can be a little bit of a point of a difference. So I reckon, I reckon Scottish boys can be four or five this year. I think that's going to be reckon. really. I think that's going to be really interesting about who you're going to get a real feel for who, how you're going to play off Gatland's picks. Because I agree with you. I think you need to take South Africa out of their comfort zone, which is playing a high tempo, movement game, keeping the ball off the floor, rather than trying yeah. to, uh, you know. Out box kick them, out defence them, out truck through them. You need to have a little bit of variation within that. Um, so I think you need some wizardry in there. But whether Gatland's going to go down that route, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Well, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, from from having my experience with him in 2017, I don't know if he will either. And I get maybe an indication would be some of the coaches who he's going to pick alongside him as well. I mean, yeah. maybe he doesn't get his, his first picks as well because I know that's happened in the past. If the coaches don't get released, but that, that might say a lot for uh, you know the type of player he's going to go for as well. And it's, I don't know whether this is a good question or a bad question, but I, I always I did this when I sort of retired, getting towards the end. Do you feel that you've got everything out of your career? Would you change anything going back, or were there anything any decisions you might have? You, you might have looked at differently now in your wizened 35 year old body <laughs> um it's a, it's a tough question tens of plus I would uh, I would have loved to have won something in Scotland uh, obviously I think looking back to, to 2015 I would have certainly changed the way we, we kicked off after we got that uh, the penalty conceded against us um, against Australia um, in terms of other things, ah, uh, nah, because you know it is what it is. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody that's that's not worked hard. I've, I've chucked everything into my queue that I possibly could, and you know, I count myself pretty lucky that I'm still playing at, at 35. And you know, certainly when I started playing the game, I, you know, I had aspirations and dreams like everybody else does. But you know, I've probably been able to fulfil a lot more of them. And in terms of being able to captain my country, play in France. Which was a big one for me. Experienced different cultures, and certainly when I started playing, I, I never thought I'd be sitting in uh, just outside Tokyo uh, play, playing for a team out here. When I started playing for my, my local rugby team, so the, the short answer is no, but probably probably a couple of little things along the way. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's been great to have you on, and at, get another couple of years, or what are you thinking? Yeah, mate, I'm feeling good. Body's feeling good. Um, I'm still in contract for, for next season anyway. I signed a, a two-season deal uh, out here. So hopefully, you know, if NTT uh, want to keep me on, if I'm still playing good rugby, I'll, I'll definitely consider it. Uh, I think you're a long time retired. Um, I love my rugby. So I'm just going to keep doing my best foot forward and see where it takes me. All right, Greg, mate, legend. Thanks for thanks for popping in and thanks for having to catch up and take care of yourself. Pleasure, mate. Thank you.